not red I experienced it being deprived being oppressed even confused it's enough now we're taking the power back we're stronger than before we proud proud are too strong the worst is over from K to Cairo I'm a Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hazel Langa. I'm the acting director responsible for university relations here at UKZ10. I've been given a pleasant task to deliver the welcome address this evening. So it is a great honor and privilege to welcome all the participants this evening. I'd like to start by acknowledging the presence of the following guests. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Musibudi Mangena, the former Minister of Science and Technology, author and activist, Siagwa Mugela Baba. Our respondents, Professor Julian Kuni from the University of Arizona, author and activist. Good morning to you, Professor Kuni. Ms. Bula Tambadu, life coach and Ashoka International Board member. Mr. Lawrence Monyahi, social justice activist and cooperative movement leader. I also welcome our facilitator, Ms. Nsagom Kabela from the Johannesburg Theater. I acknowledge the Bigo family. We also have student activists from Umtapo Students Movement members of Senate, academics and professional staff, board and patrons of UMTAPO Center, UKZ10 alumni and students, political, business and religious leaders present, veterans in the struggle for South Africa's freedom, members of the media and distinguished guests. On behalf of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, I extend a very warm welcome to everyone who has managed to join us for the 2021 annual Steve Bigo Memorial Lecture. Some of you are joining us via the UKZ10 YouTube channel. Welcome to you. And others are on this platform, um, the Zoom webinar. The University and UMTAPO Center have a long lasting, a long standing relationship of about 15 years now. So we are indeed honored to be associated with the lecture and we are delighted to be co hosting it with UMTAPO Center. The 12th of September each year heralds the death anniversary of anti apartheid activist Obabu Stephen Bantubigo. This year was the 44th anniversary of his death. His death at the hands of the South African security police had significant repercussions for not only the black consciousness movement, but also the country is all the more poorer without the benefits of his ideas and his intellect. The late Beagle was a former UKZ10 medical student in the 1970s and is remembered by us as a proud representative in the fight against oppression. It is here at UKZ10 that Beagle's political activism blossomed. Under the leadership of Steve Beagle, Black students decided to form an exclusively Black organization to advance the cause of the oppressed in South Africa. 
the South African Students' Organization, ISASO, was formed and Bigo was elected the first president of the movement. ISASO students also engaged in community development programs and artistic and literary productions. And in so doing, they moved into political defiance against the state. He played a role in fighting for access to science and mathematics education, which were denied to black students at the time. Today, institutions of higher education in South Africa, just like ours, are graduating many black students in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So as a society, we are indebted to great leaders like Ubabu Bigo for liberating us from the shackles of apartheid. In a way, the black consciousness movement has its birth at this university. It instigated a social, cultural, and political awakening in the country. There are many brilliant quotes. I heard Bula uh, uh, mentioning some of the, uh, uh, them earlier attributed to Steve Bigo and so many still relevant to this day. I'm sure we all have our favorite quotes. The most profound for me is, I quote, black consciousness is an attitude of the mind and the way of life. The most positive call to emanate from the black world for a long time, close quote. It is a contempt, it's sorry, it is a concept so revolutionary for its time that I often wonder where we would be as a country where he not so tragically struck down by the apartheid police. The University of KwaZulu-Natal is proud to be associated with the annual Steve Bigo Memorial Lecture and we celebrate his courage and leadership as a political activist. We hold him as an excellent example to our current students. The values of courage and intellect are virtues that UK Zetan aims to embody through its value system in its students and staff. His intellect and bravery left an indelible mark on the psyche of the country, and we commemorate the, leg the, the legacy of Ubabu Stephen Bego through this lecture series. It is my privilege once again to welcome you to the 2021 Annual Steve Bigo Memorial Lecture. I would like to hand over to Ms. Nzagom Kabela, who will now facilitate the proceedings. Ms. Mkabela is a theater writer, producer, and the Youth and Community Development Manager at the Johannesburg Theater. Ms. Mkabela, the virtual stage is yours, sis. Yabong. We've spent much of, much of this year reminding ourselves to unmute. I still seem to always forget still. Um, it's nice to have the virtual stage because we haven't had a chance to have many stages over the past year, but um, I'd like to welcome everybody here and thank you very much for allowing me to be part of this conversation and this discussion. Uh, when Auntie Arun called me, and I say Auntie Arun because there's one of my aunties who's calling me, I couldn't exactly say no, but I wouldn't have wanted to anyway because I feel like this could be an enriching and an important conversation. Uh, what's really important is that this is not a once-off conversation that we're having. It's not a talk shop that we're having on an annual basis to say, let's remember Biko, but it's part of an ongoing conversation. And this is a, is, is a second in a series, but this is an ongoing conversation about Black consciousness, about self, about identity, and about the nature uh, and, and the direction in which we're wanting to take our country. Um, in the beginning of, the, of, um, of um, my life, um, I remember, first of all, I think before I was introduced to Jesus, I was introduced to Steve Biko. So for me, it is it is all the more real to be part of this particular conversation. Um, and to say that a big part of my of, of mine and so many other South Africans' identities is based in the idea of Black consciousness, not because of its racial politics, but because of its humanizing politics and because of its ability to anchor not just African or Black people or people of the African diaspora, but also white people back to a sense of a, of a humanity and of a and of a core that is that runs 
through through every, everyone and everything that is human and alive and part of the world and wants to to live under the sun proudly. Um, so in the beginning of this conversation, I would like to um, in, ask Ndate Musiburi Mangena to um, lead us through some of his reflections and to share the work that he's been working on, on his book, um, Can We Fix Ourselves, which has been an interesting um, idea for me the whole time. I've been thinking to myself, are we broken? Because the idea of um, repair has has to first come with the idea that something is is amiss or out of place, and so I was curious um, um, what what your um, contributions to the conversation would be, and and um, to ha to give him the floor to share what his process and his thinking around why he wanted to write the book, why it was important, and why we find ourselves here almost. Um, how many years we've we've been in this democracy project for a while and yet we seem to constantly have to come back to this and i hear with my peers often saying do we still need steve biko is this relevant why do we need to talk about black consciousness it should seem that with um almost over two decades later this should be either something that is commonplace or something we, we no longer need to speak speak about and yet here we are again so i'll ask mr mangena to please um um take us through some of his reflections and then after that i'm going to then ask um, Pro, uh, professor julian antibula and lawrence to please um join in the conversation so that it's not a one direct this is not a lecture, but rather a conversation amongst people with a shared view and um, passion for the world and humanity. And I'm rather glad that it's not in the way that we framed it in South Africa, where you say, well, a particular race of people, as we've em embraced race, can only speak about Black consciousness and that we've opened the floor to say, we as people with a common solidarity, identify, choose to identify ourselves in a particular way. And through that way, we, we, we find our particular strengths. So Dr. Mangena, if I can please um, 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 mute myself and, 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 and allow you perhaps 10 minutes to please um, um, take us through some of your reflections. Well, thank you, Nzako. And I've just been sitting here and asking myself if uh, you are who I think you are. Um, I, <laughs> I'm never naughty in public because everybody will know my mother and father. Oh, so, no. Yes, uh, you, you know my mother and father. I'm, I'm in safe hands. And, and, and I'm talking to my daughter. She is, she is the one uh, directing this program and she will make sure that I'm well treated. Well, thank you, thank you very much, and and thank you to the uh, uh, leaders of uh, the University of uh, KZN and Umtapo Center and their leaders who might be in our, in attendance, my fellow panelists, uh, people who have joined us uh, from uh, uh, all over the country and beyond our borders. It is an enormous honor for me to participate in this meeting, the Bigo Lecture, as a speaker on the last day of September, a month during which we remember and reflect on the thought and work of one of the greatest and revered sons of our lawyers, Steve Bantu Bigo. It is a month during which many of us renew our connection and our, our credentials uh, in black consciousness and recommit to leave it and spread the philosophy to all relevant corners of our country. It is a happy coincidence that my book, We Can Fix Ourselves, is being launched in this month. Its subtitle, Building a Better South Africa Through Black Consciousness, concentrates the mind on the task at hand and the world view under which we are to act. The title of this, this event, that is the Biko Lecture, namely, Time for Azania, Let's Fix Ourselves, got me blushing. Am I too conservative or too cautious? Why is it South Africa, not Azania, as this uh, 
uh, lecture suggest. This may be a conversation to have uh, another day, and it has something to do with the, the route that one took to the publication of the book. The truth is that our country is in trouble. We might be sliding inexorably towards bankruptcy and perhaps even towards a failed state in the not, not too distant future. And because our society was brutalized for centuries, our propensity for violence is never too far from the surface. When things get really bad economically, politically, and socially, we might descend into violence and societal disintegration. The early promise of a stable democracy is fading before our very eyes. There aren't many things we seem to be doing well, except, of course, stealing. Under our watch, inequality has increased exponentially in our country to the extent that we are and remain the most unequal society on earth. The inequality in all spheres of our lives is models along racial lines. Blacks who are in political office are the poorest and sinking deeper and deeper into poverty with each passing day. Under our watch, the education of the majority of black children is mediocre to say the least. This manifests itself at many levels, including the provision of decent and adequate classrooms, libraries, and laboratories. Most schools in the townships and villages have no running water and toilets to the extent that some of our young ones fall and drown in pit latrines at school. And when we fail to deliver learning materials to our schools and NGOs take us to court to compel us to give our children books, we go to court to defend the indefensible. What is more, in both content and language, our education system is unashamedly Eurocentric and no attempt whatsoever has been made by us to introduce ourselves into that education system. No wonder the dropout rate is so bad among black children who are judged by international reading tests to be unable to read with meaning in any language. No wonder they also do very badly in mathematics and science tests. If your grasp of language is poor, you are unlikely to do well in the sciences. If children get no meaning or enjoyment out of learning, they will drop out. And we know it is mainly black children who are victims of this problematic educational arrangement. Under our watch, municipalities are a thorough shambles. Apart from the Auditor General's reports that year in and year out present a picture of chaos, corruption, misspending, mismanagement, accounts presentations that are incomprehensible. We can, with our own eyes, see the filth, the uncollected refuse, sewage running in the streets, potholes, bucket toilets, and so on, most of which are encountered mainly in the townships and villages where Black people live. The majority of Black people running these municipalities do not seem to care a hoot. Under our watch, the management of immigration and migration is a mess, leading to sporadic conflicts between poor South African citizens and migrants from other countries on the continent of Africa. We end up being labeled Afrophobic when all we are guilty of is gross ineptitude. This is an affront to what has historically happened in this country where Africans from different parts of the continent were exploited together with, Af with South Africans in the mines, on the farms and elsewhere. An exploitation that built this country into what it is today. We intermarried and lived together in peace 
inspiring the legendary Yuma Sikela to pen and perform his masterpiece song, Stimel. And in fact, Nsoka Mkavela is an example of this, and she's chairing this program now. It is an attitude that saw South African police retreating as they were pelted with stones and half bricks in the center of Johannesburg by foreign nationals for daring to search for illegal imports. It is an, an ineptitude that sees South African truck drivers and those from other African countries fighting one another, sometimes with fatal consequences. This because we have simply failed to manage migration and labor relations. Under our watch, our country is among the least safe in the world, especially for women and children. Some among us boast about having one of the most pro progressive constitutions on earth, among other things, that outlaws the death penalty. Yet we allow criminals to terrorize citizens and murder people at a frightening rate. What is the use of the best constitution in the world if we are oppressed by crime? When criminals perpetrate horrific crimes against women and children, of what value is this constitution if women and children cannot walk the streets of their country in safety? You outlaw the death penalty, but allow criminals to take the lives of citizens at a rate higher than in most war zones. Under our watch, there has been no meaningful land reform in the last 27 years of democracy. Whites who constitute just um, around 9% of the population still own and control 72% of all arable land in the country. For our population of 16 million people, there is enough land in the country to share among citizens. Instead, you have us, including our leaders, frequently singing about our land that was stolen by colonialists. We could go on and on referencing our anti-Black behavior in the arts, in music, in culture, the plight of our languages, the almost complete neglect of our cuisine. In fact, a lot of our children know more about fast foods than what their own people eat. And as Malcolm X has observed, we cannot expect other people to, to accept us if we are not acceptable to ourselves. Other people the world over cannot enjoy or accept our cuisine, attire, and our other attributes if we neither know nor appreciate them ourselves. Thus, in the areas of cuisine, the arts and culture, we are almost invisible to ourselves and in our own country. Perhaps we are happy to set aside the 24th of September as Heritage Day, a day in which we try to remember who we are. But how can you introduce yourself to yourself only one day in a year? Who are you the rest of the year? We have no business finding ourselves in this position with so many factors in our favor. Firstly, we are in political office, which means we control parliament, the government, and therefore the national budget. We could use these to advance the interests of the black community in education, in health, in business and social development. Instead, we steal the resources, underspend, mismanage, or waste them. No application at all to ensure we take the black majority out of poverty. Secondly, there is enough knowledge in the country to direct the affairs of our country. We have sufficient knowledge produced by and residing in our universities, research institutions, colleges, and others to guide our work. 
but we would not use that because there is no burning desire in our hearts to do the right, the right thing by our people. Thirdly, there is plenty engineering and technical, technical expertise in our country to take care of our developmental needs. Just look at our roads, our bridges, stadia, hotels, and other such capacity that we could use to take care of our developmental needs. With such expertise, there is no reason why our rail transport system and municipalities should be in such a shocking state of disrepair and dysfunctionality. Fourthly, with the sophisticated infrastructure we have in the form of the banking, insurance, telecoms and others, there is no reason why that should coexist with shocking levels of poverty and despair that is found in the black component of the population. There is no serious attempt on our part to ensure that this attribute is harnessed for the good of the poorer section of our population. Fifthly, the state has under its control over 700 state-owned enterprises, some of which are huge and critical in the economy. ESCO, Transnet, and others could be used not only to enable the state to intervene and guide the direction and industrialization of the economy, but also as training entities for all sorts of skills required for our young people and the economy. The previous regimes used them in this way, albeit for the benefit of the minority racial group in the country. Instead, we use them as sites of the most shocking corruption and sleaze immanageable. We even gave free reign to the Gupta family to simply rob us blind and repatriate the loot to Dubai, India, and heaven knows where else. The question is, why is it that prevent Blacks, even when they have political office and the resources that go with it, to employ them to advance their own cause and that of their people? Why is it that we would keep on complaining about the white 10% minority, about their racism, and about their domination of the economic heights of our economy? Why don't whites have to complain about our discrimination against them? Is it because we admire and worship them? Why is it predominantly the black majority complaining against the white minority? Why can't we work to improve our stake in the economy now that we are in control of the levers of the state? Why can't we be, build big companies that we can control instead of complaining how we are not represented in the management of the corporate work sector in our country? In a previous engagement related to this book, Professor Kwandiwe Kwondlo remarked that black people don't trust one another. Of course they don't. And in part, this has to do with their many centuries of slavery, colonization and oppression in many guises, especially of the African component thereof. In these many centuries, some blacks collaborated with foreigners in taking fellow Blacks into slavery. And I dare say that has not changed. That's why we have to be deliberate in our fight for Black consciousness to take root and the solidarity it implies. Bandu Biko writes somewhere in his essay entitled We Blacks, I quote him, this is the first truth, bitter, as it may seem, that we have to acknowledge before we can start on any program designed to change the status quo. It becomes more necessary to see the truth as it is 
if you realize that the only vehicle for change are these people who have lost their personality. The first step, therefore, is to make the black man come to himself, to pump back life into his empty shell, to infuse him with pride and dignity, to, re to remind him of his complicity in the crime of allowing himself to be misused and therefore letting evil reign supreme in the country of his birth. This is what we mean by an inward looking process. That is the definition of black consciousness, those codes. Nothing proves these ways in my one to people more emphatically than what has happened in the last 27 years of democracy in said Africa. That is, you can have as beautiful a constitution as you like, you can have as many progressive laws as you like. You can be awash with mineral resources as, as South Africa is. You can have as much book knowledge as many Black South Africans have. But if you remain mentally enslaved, you cannot use these advantages for your benefit. In other words, unless we restore the damaged psyche of Black people, we would not be able to build a better South Africa that would nurture its black citizens. We would also not be able to build an anti-racist society that many of us yearn for. Quite a number of suggestions are made in the book about the way forward. But the most fundamental is that we should infuse the philosophy of black consciousness into the black population in as huge amounts as we can manage. Without that, our lot would not change for the better. Black consciousness being an attitude of mind and a way of life, it must manifest itself in the manner in which we live, the manner in which we teach our children, what we teach our children, the content of our educational curriculum, the medium of institute of instruction in our schools and institutions of higher learning, what we eat, it must manifest itself in how we dress and how we dance. Our children in early childhood development centers must have rhymes and educational toys they play with in their own languages. Our writers must write these rhymes for them. Our primary school libraries must be stocked with books written in their own languages, just as all education at the foundation fees must be in the, in the home languages of the children. Our emphasis must be on making education meaningful, understandable to the children and relevant for their needs but it must also uphold their dignity, their worth, and their heritage. They must see themselves in the education system. Since the wiring in our heads is wrong, we should rewire our heads through an education system that respects our languages, our mores, our cultures, and our traditions. This is what the decolonization of the education system would mean at that level. Not just sloganeering about a decolonized education in the corridors of university buildings. This is what the manifestation of black consciousness will look like in the upbringing of our children and therefore future adults. The book then looks at suggestions in the education system as we go higher and higher. When the children have started their, their education journey in their own languages, introducing such languages at our universities will be like pop and plays. I've heard today that uh, leaders of uh, higher education institutions are meeting and talking about how to decolonize education 
uh, at, the, at their institutions, including the introduction of black languages. How do you do that? These children don't understand or have not learned in their own languages from kindergarten through the foundation phase throughout their educational journey. The book proposes that the philosophy of black consciousness or African humanism be an integral part of the ethos and underlying orientation of the civil service. Most of our civil servants do not lack knowledge or skills to run a productive, responsive, respectful, efficient, and humane service. They lack consciousness, ethics, and respect for themselves and the people who look like, like them. They are people whose heads need to be fixed, just as Bantu people says in the words we have just quoted above. With our heads rewired and fixed, the book makes several suggestions relating to governance, transport, land reform, the running and utilization of state-owned enterprises, housing, policing, and so on. But that would only work if our mindset has been changed and orientated in such a way that Black people begin to have a better opinion of themselves, appreciate their humanity, their worth, and dignity more than they do now. At the risk of stating the obvious, it must be emphasized that Black consciousness is not a tool or a skill to be employed to give Black people land. A skill to run ESCOM effectively and efficiently or govern a municipality properly. But it is a mindset that would propel Black people to work better and more determinedly for their, their country and one another. Chris Van Wyk wrote rather optimistically in 2007 that now that we have levers of state in our hands, we will be able to show ourselves and the world a more human face. He was obviously quoting from one of the most iconic sayings of Bandu Piku. It appears Van Weyck had not sufficiently reckoned with the damaged psyche of Black people. This more human face would not emerge anytime soon if the majority Black people suffer from the debilitating colonial mentality that sees them running as fast as they can from themselves and those that look like them. 15 years after Chris wrote those words, the more human face is not imaging, but retreating. Perhaps the image of people on the cover of this book, working on the head of a black head, is very apt. The fixed head may just lead to a fixed society and country. And a country which is so fixed will emerge, which we can proudly call Azania. Thank you, Nzako. Baba, thank you so much. Um, I think that was, pardon me, just uh, get myself back. Thank you so much for um, for sharing those words and for and for taking the time to write the book. I'm finding that a lot of the time, um, young people are now saying, is Steve Biko still relevant? Is black consciousness relevant? Because it feels as though every time you look at the covers of the book or the inside covers of the book, you're always finding a year that says 1970 so or 1960 so. And so some, sometimes because we take the common knowledge is that if, if, if the age on a thing is old, then the thing must be old. 
And so often we say, well, the, the, is this really still relevant? So taking the time to write again and to contribute and add to, um, to the discourse, I think is, is um, really important. Um, to this, I, I, I would like the panelists to, um, to, to perhaps engage with, but I think um, with, with each one engaging, if, if I may just leave, or, or if I may start with a question just to probe um, as a way to say, um, perhaps before you go into your own reflections, you can riddle me this. So as Ndata um finished his presentation, he called this country Azania. Um, and not the geographical location that um, GPS would give you, which is South Africa. Um, and so since I was little, I've always known that we were um, Azania because I'm a child of Azapo. And so th th that has always been the, the name of the country for me. And it, just thinking about the country made me think of uh, Umam Sbogina Kumalo, who um, is, is now late, um, God rest her soul. But one of the things she said in a conversation I remember with her was that the process of naming a thing is a process of giving it um, beingness. So that if, um, and I'm not religious, but I do find religious um, references interesting at times. But if God creates the world by, by, by uttering words to say, let there be, and so, and so creation happens, if you live in a country that has not yet been proclaimed to say, let there be this, but rather we're still just um, a convenient way to find us, what does that mean about who we are is intrinsically, who we are in terms of our beingness? And if we truly have called ourselves into being, or are we just surviving? Are we just moving forward in a in, in, in a space, in a place, but that we haven't fully come to own and own ourselves in it and own our right to be in it. And so um, I'll just, uh, perhaps I can start with you, Professor Julian, to, or um, Antibula, let me start with you. Let me be slightly sexist on this one um, and go ladies first. But um, if, if, if I were to then ask you and say, what does it mean to you to be speaking about the, about the damage, about the, about the regression, about the state of a place that has no name. What does that actually mean? Is, is there a way to find form and to create yourself in the absence of a language about who, who and what you are, not only to yourself, but, to you, but, but, but also to the world? Thank you, Nsato. So it's interesting that you say that. Um, I returned to South Africa in 1977 and Steve Biko's death was the most impactful event. And I was also uh, drawn into the Azanian People's Organization. I have been a member of the BCM. And uh, one of the things I learned as a teenager was that about Azania, about what that would mean when that uh, when we achieved freedom, when we achieved the dreams, the, black, the dreams of the Black Consciousness Movement and, and other freedom fighters. And let me just say that Mtapo Center was very intentional about the title of, of this webinar today. It didn't just come out of nowhere. We were talking, the task team, Arun and Dina, and we were talking about what have we been robbed of for 27 years for not having had one name, one country name to unite us. What, do, what did that mean? How much loss has that meant for us? So I took that uh, particular question on very, very seriously. And I, I want to thank Comrade Mangino to thank him very much because this book is so well-timed. It is so important. I'm not just saying that because I'm on this webinar. Uh, it has it has so many solutions, but that's the third thing I wanted to say. I wanted to, to say that to the, the people, many people attending this webinar. This is not just a, a historical backward glance. This is a solutions-driven book. 
and you need to know that, but I will get to that. Let me in Sato first say what I, I, I wanna say. So I did some work on if Google is to be trusted. I did some work on the meaning of Azania and, and, and there's a Zulu meaning, which is the two different definitions. One is heard by God. The other is God is listening. The ancient Greek describes Azania as simply the Eastern area of Africa. Africa from Kenya to Tanzania. So it's just a tropical area. So it's geographical in that way. But in this book, on page 2,204, uh, I want to I read. Black consciousness in the era of democracy should shift gears moving from a diagnostic tool of the black condition and its attendant call to war against the white in minority tyranny to a positive force for a radical mindset change. It must propel us to move with haste towards the realization of a caring, more equal and shining society we can all be proud of. It must be the instrument we use to rewire our heads in such a way that we are enabled to take full advantage of the political power we have, our mineral wealth, our rich and varied soil and climatic conditions, the energy and the genius of our people to build a society where the color of your skin and the area of origin would not be a point of reference. As Biko put it, it would be an azania where there shall be no black and white people, but just people. So in quoting from that page, I'm, I'm wanting people who have not yet read the book, not yet bought the book, and who might dare to think that it is uh, historic and, and, and maybe uh, not looking to the future sufficiently. I assure you that it is. The other, uh, the other point that uh, Comrade Mangena makes, and, I, and, and this is in reference to Azania as well, all successful nations in the world have an individual character and identity that manifests in their language, cultural expression, attire and cuisine, among other things. We don't have any of these. We are as amorphous and shapeless as an amoeba. By the way, um, your writing and your turn of phrase sometimes reminds me of a lot of people in the older generation, straight up. It's straight up and it causes us to do something about it, to get up and do something about it. So you say here, maybe that is why we are so messed up. We don't know who we really are. Maybe that is why we don't seem to do anything properly in a coherent and cohesive manner. We can't teach our children at every level of their education journey. We can't heal one another in hospitals and clinics. We do horrible, cruel, and indescribable things to women and children. We don't seem to have perfected anything in the last 27 years except corruption. That's really tough. That's really hard and harsh. But it's important because one of the first steps towards healing is to not be in denial. And that's one thing nobody can ever accuse Dr. Mengena of in this book. We are not in denial. He's not in denial. He states every single problem that this country is encountering. I mean, he covers in chapters um, in great detail and, 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 and in a very colloquial and easy to read and inviting way. So the point I want to make about, I want to, I want to borrow, I want to take some license here and borrow from what is a cultural phenomenon. I don't know if any of you have heard of the 27 Club. Well, what the 27 Club is, is it's highlighting the musicians, the artists, the actors, and athletes who died at the age of 27, with many of their deaths linked to high-risk lifestyles. And so I want to stop my first uh, input on that. It's 27 years. It's time for the high-risk lifestyle that, we, that has led us to this point in this country to, to die. And maybe this book is heralding a time where 
we can at least take some steps toward becoming the Azania that we want and have wanted for so long. Thank you, Nsako, and thank you, Hamid Magena. Thank you so much, um, Ati. Um, that's really interesting what you're saying about the 27 Club. I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, so I suppose this is a do or die moment for us. We, we keep coming to these moments where it's a do or die and we kind of scamper on but don't find new life. And, and I suppose now this is a moment to say, what are we going to do going forward? Um, Professor Julian, if, if I can direct the, um, the feedback to you now, um, and just taking, just from um, Professor Mangena's um, contribution, a lot of it seemed, yes, directed at the, at the spirit and the nature of the people, but in terms of how it would get done was very um, institutionalized and very um, structured within, within given state entities like the Department of Education, the Department of Health and such and such. And I just wanted to ask you about how South Africa's absolute um, um, ro romanticization of this idea of the political party and political entities um, in, in place of political movements in order to um, either, either address social issues or be able to actually articulate what is needed and, 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 and where it is we want to go. Every, right now we're in election um, phase and everybody's kind of listening to say, what are the politicians gonna offer us? But that seems to me very interesting that it's not a thing of saying, what is it that we want? And then they have to respond to that. So I just, I, I, that, that was one question I wanted to pose to you as you go into your contributions, just about our absolute love and acceptance of this, of this animal called the political party as the only vehicle for um, our social expression. Um, Bongila Kokulu, Ms. M. Cabela. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, okay. Um, I just want to say um, thank you very much for giving me the honor of responding here to Comrade Mangena's um, very important book, very timely book, uh, We Can Fix Ourselves. And um, as South Africa now enters uh, this phase of elections, um, municipal elections and, um, you know, uh, participation in, in new structures and, and uh, elections of new individuals and so forth, um, a very challenging time for everybody and uh, also a very violent time. And I think the question that one has to ask is why is there violence? You know, what has been the catalyst for the eruption of violence? And uh, the book, um, unfortunately, I haven't had a copy of the book. I, di I did have the last uh, seven pages um, scanned to me from Umtapo. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, but the and, and, and the way that we go about looking at this situation of South Africa and, and Comrade Mangana's concern about, you know, the decaying state, South Africa being in a crisis, um, uh, virtually bankrupt, um, you know, in several ways. I mean, it seems economically and financially and morally, too, you know. Uh, it's almost as if this aura of black pessimism has taken over. And um, for me, uh, looking at the, the South African, the Azanian reality, and I think it's so important to use the term Azania to begin to uh, understand how it is that South Africa was named. You know, that has a lot to do with Christopher Columbus um, and, and his invasion of the Caribbean and the way that he named islands and those islands that were originally uh, um, populated and uh, resided by, by the Arabs, uh, uh, the Arawaks and the Caribs and the Tainos and so forth, various 
uh, millions uh, of indigenous people was, was taken over, expropriated, you know, by the Spanish. So naming has a lot to do with colonization. I think that is really important uh, for us to all understand that we need to rename, we need to redefine ourselves in relationship, not only to our local reality, but always to keep in mind our global reality. And this is where, you know, the book has made some very, very important points about uh, justice reform, about the need, very importantly, for uh, indigenous African languages. Um, I gave a talk at UNISA, um, I think 15 years ago, on the need for the institutionalization of African languages. And Neville Alexander, in fact, was working quite a bit on this together. Uh, and, and a woman asked me, well, uh, Professor Cooney, you're saying that we need to emphasize African languages and introduce it all the way through to high school and even into tertiary education. Um, do you want us to continue to be poor? And, and this is the kind of image we have, you know, where we continue to consider because of the colonized mentality, English as the salvific, liberating uh, uh, lingua franca, the passport to economic prosperity. So, you know, when you look at all of these recommendations uh, that are made about black humanism, about the need for uh, the institutionalization of African languages and the redoing of significant portions of the South African social and economic system and, and provision of services and so on. I mean, where in the townships, for example, you see, you know, uh, collapse in the sanitation uh, the continued existence of the bucket system and so on. And, and uh, I, I have some articles in the Cape Times which kind of explicate and elaborate on some of these things. But I think the most important thing when we talk about Azania and the black consciousness movement, while we need to fix ourselves, it's very important to also underscore that the problem is not entirely ours. You know, um, in the United States, in the black world that has been victimized and mesmerized and virtually destroyed, you know, by slavery and capitalism, slavery, colonization and capitalism, you know, we ne always need to keep in mind the broader picture of what's defining our reality, what is causing us to react. And so the major problem that I see in, 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 in the litany of social ills, of deprivation, of impoverishment, of lack of health care, of lack of uh, effective uh, social services delivery, of, of the underfunded schools, schools that don't have adequate running water, toilets, sanitation, decent roofs and windows, you know, uh, in the villages, in the rural parts of the Eastern Cape, in, in Pokeng, and in, in uh, you know, in the rural parts of Gauteng, in the Northwest, and Popo, and so forth. Uh, KwaZulu, I mean, what is the root cause? So very importantly, the entrenched nature of the capitalist system in South Africa has to be the most important question that we all need to raise candidly because we are all participating. We are bathing in this global capitalist system regardless of where we are. Within the South African reality, the question is, do black people really have power, real and authentic power to define the South African reality on indigenous African and diverse African terms? Or is it a case that there is pseudo political power, a compromised sense of African independence, like most of Africa, but virtually zero economic power and independence because of the 1985 meeting between the ANC and the Nationalist Party in West Africa that led to the unbanning of uh, the liberation movement in 1990 and the 1994 elections. The ANC government, 
is, is, has been a stalwart and a key surrogate regime of the global capitalist system. I have to say that. And I have many comrades within the ANC, and I think this is one of the reasons why there are so many divisions in that political organization, that historic oldest liberation movement of Africa. Western capital considers capitalist South Africa its most important haven for investment, profit, and military and cultural dominance on the continent. South Africa will not be able to accomplish any of the recommendations of black ownership, of land and the economy and business redistribution as is proposed by we can fix ourselves. Consider for example, that not one viable bank in South Africa is black owned, is black owned, similar to that of the United States. Capitalism is the root cause of the decay, degradation, failure of effective structure of public services, continued impoverishment, deprivation, and violence. Capitalism is a violent system because it is rooted in exploitation and slavery. The violence in the overcrowded townships, especially against women and children, isolated villages where there are hardly any public services like clinics and healthcare, where most black people live on the margins. Capitalism is fundamentally corrupt. So when we talk about corruption in South Africa, we always need to go back to the backdrop. What created that corruption? You know, what created this kind of fragmentation? The practice of greed and the role models of those in government that's disseminated and, and diffused to all contours and sectors of the society people being killed for a cell phone. Now we could never imagine that because we didn't have cell phones during the heyday of black consciousness, right? But to take somebody's life for a material object has very much to do with capitalism. Capitalism is about protecting property, protecting the landowners. And so it, the way that that system has evolved is that it nurtures the pathological culture of greed and profit and monetary pursuit that's held sacred. That's held sacred as the most important value, pursuit of money and profit. The very high and lucrative salary, salaries for those in government and the CEOs of corporations earning tens of millions and businesses that dominate the economy in South Africa, just like the United States, like in much of the capitalist world, filters to the marginalized black impoverished. What kind of things do you have to aspire to while most are stuck and confined to overcrowded and tiny townships? Soweto, Alexandra, Tembisa, Mahung, Imbali, Pamashu, Inanda, Ndansani, Zuelicha, all crossroads, Kaya you know, Kaya is still the same from when I was there years ago, the Cape Flats, you know, while people don't have enough for food and sustenance. And then we have a pandemic lockdown, 2 million black women lost basic income because all the best, best services and provisions are privatized because the privatization of hegemonic capital is the core principle of capitalism, a slave system built off slavery. So when we look at healthcare, for example, you know, why is it that 80% of the budget goes towards privatized healthcare? Discovery is responsible. There needs to be a rediscovery of how it is that public health can be free decent, fully funded, and provide adequate hair, uh, care and maintenance and treatment and diagnostic testing, fully funded hospitals, training of nurses with decent salaries and doctors so that everybody can become a part of the public sphere, not pride themselves towards being part of the privatized system where the 
elite in South Africa benefits. So the movement of black consciousness, and it is a movement, we can fix ourselves. South Africa too prides itself in being part of the so-called West and pays perfunctory lip service to being an essential African country that serves the needs of the African continent, particularly the working classes, trade unions, women, women's organizations, men, children, and youth, those living in the rural parts of the, of the country and the continent who are obscured from the reality, who don't have access to much of what urban dwellers may have, who still aspire towards things which are European and Eurocentric and Western. South Africa must return to Mamba Africa, I wrote some years ago. Culturally, economically, working class oriented most importantly, socially, and very importantly, educationally. I see that as one of the most important things in We Can Fix Ourselves. Children need to be taught in indigenous African languages. Those languages need to be disseminated at all levels, all the way into high school, into the civil service, into the public sector. Everybody needs to learn different African languages. Most people may speak three or four or five la African languages in South Africa, as in the rest of Africa. They need to be institutionalized, funding to provide children with books in their mother tongue. And so, so that true African humanism and economic and land justice redistributive and indigenous African socialism in all of its diversity. Indigenous African socialism in all of its diversity. In essence, black consciousness. In essence, socialism with Azanian characteristics that Steve Biko taught and lived, a way of life as he called it, a way of being that is rooted in sharing and caring rather than in cultures from hamburger backgrounds as part of a dog eat dog colonial capitalist system is what Steve Biko said. While the South African constitution has wonderful human rights protections with parallel to this US so-called democratic constitution, the protections mean little, very little. While the monopolistic capitalist system is firmly ensconced in the South African political economy and way of life and doing things. Biko echoed that there will be no race classifications in a liberated Azania, South Africa, because we all belong to one human race. In the quote from Subukwe, uh, we can fix ourselves. No protection or privileges for minority groupings. No minority and no majority groupings, just Azanian people. Such a raceless society is impossible under capitalism a system founded and built of the chattel enslavement and genocide of Africans and indigenous Indians in the Western hemisphere and the coerced, forced, free and confiscated labor of people of color from Asia and the Pacific. Read more about this in Chinwezes, the West and the rest of us, white predators, black slavers and the African elite, a true black consciousness book from 1974. Finally, the global picture of racist repression and capitalist exploitation reminds us that South African suffering, particularly of that of the black working class, women, men, and children, youth, the unemployed and destitute, the illiterate and isolated village elders and folk is certainly not isolated. Black suffering is indeed genocide, but the South African, Azanian, impoverished are certainly not alone in reality. 80% of the world's people are in the same boat, are in the same boat as Azanian people, as South African people are. The repressed masses of the indigenous people in the Western hemisphere, 700 million in this hemisphere, the people of Latin America and the Caribbean, the people of Asia and the Pacific, where 60% of the world lives, most in a very impoverished and marginalized conditions, because of capitalism and racism. It is high time, very high time, overextended, that South Africa, Azania develop with the leadership of the black working class in particular, and all those who are allies, regardless 
of color, a socialism with a Zanian characteristics, using the cultural and linguistic and people diversity and capacity that, was, that needs to be developed. In the same vein as China, where I've taught and lectured six times, the leading socialist nation on earth with almost 20% of the world's people now reverting to its indigenous Chinese socialist roots so that the latest book being propagated, which we're involved with, Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics is being taught to children, young people, and all students at all levels as part of the cultural and economic transformation. Knowing that China has extricated and uplifted 850 million people from deep poverty over the past 25 years, unparalleled, unprecedented in the world, under the Chinese socialist independence banner, while clinging onto the socialist principle and vision. Yes, it is a practical socialism and inspiration for all the people in the world, particularly in Mama Africa, with 1.374 billion people, almost as many as China and Azania and South Africa in particular. Siabonga Kakunu. Ungadinwa Nagomso, Ya Leboha, Asante Sana, Baya Danki, Ahi, Ahi, Miigwech. I thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Julian. You've given us a lot to, um, to have to think about. And I think what was really interesting about your contribution is something that a lot of young South Africans struggle with is that we have almost fully embraced the idea of that capitalism is the only way that works. Forget the fact that that's a, that, 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 that is a statement that keeps being disproved all the time, but there's a kind of a, an idea that we all are willing to accept that this is the only thing that works. And so sometimes when you speak about the principles of black consciousness, they seem to clash with, with our um, aspirations aspirations, even as young people, where we have financial asp um, aspirations. Where you feel as though in order for your life to, um, to sit, I think what's important to up is that black consciousness is more than just a race politics, is more than being in a um, pleasant manner, but really something that requires a shift in, in so many things in, in the very logic that we have about the world, about ourselves and about how we interact. But before um, we will come back to some of these thoughts and ideas and engage, but I think um, right now I wanted to invite Lawrence, um, who's, who is part of our panel to um, give his reflections of, um, um, on, um, on, on Dr. Mangena's book. And Lawrence, for you, I think, um, I think my, my, my mind had been going where um, Professor Julian was going, but the idea where I first learned about, the, uh, about uh, black consciousness proper was my mother's explanation of Izan and Bilo, which seemed like such a, um, a, a people centric idea that in order for us to, to be treated with, um, with dignity, we must treat ourselves with dignity. And so I wanted to ask you this, especially as a, as a, as a younger person on the panel, this idea that do, do you think that we are in a place where we are willing personally to make the kind of sacrifices that are required to be able to make the change on a national and, and on a broader level? Thanks so much, uh, uh, Zako, for the opportunity. Um, and I would want to pass my regards to the leadership of UKZN, leadership of Mtapo, um, and uh, you know the, my fellow panelists, um, uh, Dr. Mangena, who has written quite a profound book. And you know all the attendees to this important um, uh, Steve Biko uh, lecture. Uh, perhaps one would would like to uh, before I venture into the 
reflections on the book itself, uh, but rather to ask uh, 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 Dr. Mangena and uh, perhaps everyone who managed to have a hand on the on the book, uh, you know, to answer the question, who is the target audience of the book? And I'll venture more on that in my in my concluding remarks, uh, because um, you know uh, I've been involved in Umtapo programs. In, uh, uh, our uh, you know moderator and Zaku, uh, for for more than ten years, uh, both in the Peace Africa Youth Center, but also working directly with uh, directly with the with the office in Durban. And Umtapo uh, was, was founded against the backdrop uh, that there was interest and violence in KwaZulu Natal in particular, but in South Africa in general, you know, the so-called uh, black on black violence. And at the heart of the, of, of the focus, strategic focus of Umtapo Center was its slogan, free the mind, free the land, very profound because uh, unless we are able to free ourselves from, from the mental slavery, from, the, from our mental borders, we will not perhaps be able to you know, free the land. And, and we know that for instance, that the land is everything. Uh, and and I, get, I get very worried uh, that many people when they, uh, talk about land, they confine it only to agriculture. And, and I think Dr. Mangena in his book, he, he actually articulates that very well, a need for, for, for the uh, redistribution of, 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 of the land. And I think just like Umtapo uh, center work over the years, uh, Dr. Mangena premised his book on, on uh, the issue of access to land. But, but what we need to also understand is that even some within the, the Congress movement, uh, if one may cite just one uh, individual, the former General Secretary of the South African Communist Party, Chris Ani, who has called for the, for the uh, retaining of the land to its, to its rightful owners. And I think, uh, uh, you know, D Dr. Mangena in his book make uh, reference that um, uh, the former Chief Justice Museneke actually highlights that, uh, you know, expropriation without compensation is possible within the confines of the, of the constitution. And this is against the backdrop that uh, there is a process happening in the country. And I think he argues in his, in his book that, uh, you know, it will not happen. <laughs> You know, which which is which is quite interesting, which is quite intriguing, uh, because because you know if that has to, is something to go by, it therefore means that uh, the current uh, you know structure of, of the constitution uh, you know provides for uh, expropriation of land without without com compensation. So so in essence, uh, uh, the the you know, the, the, the work I think broadly of Mtapo was around uh, building an anti-racist society through educate, peace, human rights and anti-racism education. And that in the main focused on, on young people because unless we build critical consciousness, we'll not be able to achieve the, the, the ultimate, uh, ultimate goal. And I think the book by Dr. Mangena uh, covers quite, a, a, you know, quite a diverse area uh, in, in our society. And I think education, uh, how we educate our children, I think that, that is chapter two, is, is it's, it's another part, critical component of, of, of his book. And, you know, it, it explores the limitations around the use of, you know, the medium of instruction in South Africa for learning and teaching for both the old and the young. Uh, you know, and we, we are therefore saying that uh, uh, it is structured in such a way that it does not promote education for innovation. It, it does not promote education for, for skills development because it, it actually um, uh, focuses its attention 
on uh, uh, on on basically uh, uh, you know uh, uh, just teaching people for the sake of teaching them and i mean uh, uh, learner students uh, memorize these things in english and and may not be able to uh, put them put them into 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 practice and i think uh, dr mangena questions uh, why when we want to train a plumber or a carpenter uh, we have to do that in in a, in a foreign language now to keep to give a practical example uh, we were part of the uh, national skills conference uh, on the 28th and 29th of 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 september 2021 just some few days back uh, in johannesburg and and uh, as delegates in that uh, conference we raised sharply the issue around ensuring that the indigenous, indigenous languages are at the center of learning and teaching. Now, the same was the issue of land, which was brought up quite strongly to say, how do you then talk about skills development in the green economy, for example, without necessarily locating it within the, the, the land question in the country? And, and it came out very strongly. But you see, the limitations are that, uh, you know, there is docent dissonance in our a, a, you know, a, in our policy making, because government departments and entities, small, uh, SOEs, as uh, Dr. Mangena was referring in, in, in his book, and the role that they can be able to play in skills development and, and, and so forth, um, you know, we're not there. Uh, the National Treasury, which in my own view, it's a government within a government because you know the the national treasury can actually come propose a policy position which may not be that of even the 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 the, the ruling the the you know the governing party and, and so forth so you know entities like the department of uh, communication and Di digital services uh, you know the De department of minerals and energy the the uh, you know all the departments that are relevant uh, in actually enabling that skills development takes place in a much more coherent and coordinated way, we're not there. So we plan as if these other departments do not exist, or you know these other we have full control over these other entities and 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 government and government departments. And I think that's where I think the the biggest challenge in terms of form, policy formulation is now. At a grassroots level, Mtapo, uh, since inception, has made a huge impact and influence on the type of leadership that this country needs. And this was achieved through a dedicated training on peace, human rights, and anti-racism. Dr. Mangena, in his book, uh, make reference to the work done by the uh, Black Consciousness Movement stalwarts, uh, you know, Shagura Chidi, Monelo Bongo, Pandirani Noforobodwe, uh, uh, Peter Jones, through the Isibaya Development Trust in the in the Oatambo District Municipality in in the in the in the in the Eastern Cape, but but, but the ongoing concern of Umtapo is is now the, the the going concern of Umtapo is is now threatened uh, because of you know challenges like uh, access to to resources because we know that uh, uh, with the advent of the COVID nineteen many uh, you know uh, uh, countries have actually. Uh, 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 you know, scale down in terms of support. And we are therefore saying, I think the question that uh, Dr. Mangena might, might also need to reflect on is, you know, what therefore becomes the, uh, you know, in, the, in, the influence on our policy position uh, by imperialists and uh, entity institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, as well as the rating agencies and so on. And I think uh, just in conclusion, I mean, I was going to talk about other work that is being done elsewhere, but in, in, in conclusion is that the most important question who is the target audience, which I posed when, when in my opening remarks, uh, you know, uh, which Dr. Mangena poses in his book, um, uh, you know, it articulates very well the challenges and, and, and solutions. And therefore, most of the solutions are placed squarely on, uh, on decision makers, right? And where, where, are they, where are they and how can we be able to reach them in, in the context of the platform to influence policy? You know, are policy makers willing to utilize the Black consciousness philosophy as their Wi-Fi or they choose 
other available broadband services in the in the spectrum. And I think, uh, you know, that would be my 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 concluding remarks. But you know, the book can be translated in other languages. But I can see that uh, you know, because of the publishing uh, uh, rules and so on, uh, it places a bit of limitations on the use of the book in the peace clubs and and other interest groups that may be um, and may be there because we want the the Martian visitor or visitor from Mars as uh, Dr. Mangena referred to his book, to see us as who we are uh, in terms of language, in terms of our culture, and, and, and many other aspects of our, of our lives. Uh, thank you so much, Nzako, and, and thank you so much uh, for, for, for listening to uh, this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your responses. I've just been looking on the side, um, reading questions that people are posing and because we're not alone in this conversation. Um, but I suppose for me, as one and more of you speak in here, I, I think I'll begin to, for about five minutes or so, pose myself to, to the broader um, community amongst us and um, some of the youth from, from the UMDAPO youth, youth, youth programs, people can just put up their hands. And if you can limit yourself to maybe two minute max um, in, in responding to the questions. But it seems to me if, um, if society was made up by a number of different pillars, government and state being one of them, business being another of them, the third one being the people as it were kind of this idea of we the people my question would be how do we how do we empower that space i can understand that you the um statements about the lack of policy making the roles of government equally to the roles of business globally the global business um capitalist ideology part of what intrigues me about black consciousness is that it places a lot of um, uh, emphasis on the people. And it seems that your question was saying, can we fix us? I'll, so perhaps I'll, I'll address this a little bit to um, to uh, Dr. Mangena just for two minutes or so to say, when you say we fix us, what do you mean? Are you speaking about it at a state national policy planning level? Or is there a different thing that you're saying is broken? It, are you simply focusing yourself on the on the breaks within the South African state, the nation state as it were, or, or are you bringing it back to these ideas of black consciousness that are so much about, about personhood, about spirit, about mind, about how a person lives and, 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 and feels themselves in the world so that it's not only confined to structure, but also um, people. So I'm trying to place the role of people in the solutions then being um, being brought forward. If I can, if I can put put that forward to Ndata Mangena first, and then invite anybody else who might have something um, to add um, to be part of the conversation. Uh, thank you, Nzako. Um, you notice that in the, the book, um, I talk about us as black people. I try my best to. Um, stay as far away as possible from political parties and, and try and uh, or even uh, blame certain political parties for uh, whatever they are doing. The thing is that we as a collective, as black people are messed up and therefore we deserve a government that we, we, we get because the, uh, there will be no government that we don't like that will come into power through the, 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 the ballot, which does not represent us. But we as black people should find ourselves, should affirm ourselves, our personality, our worth as human beings, our dignity and so on love ourselves and our communities, not try and run away from who we are. Because when we do that, then we cannot work together as a people. If I'm a teacher and I don't love myself and my people, I will not teach the children at, at school. I, I'm just going there to collect my check. 
And if I'm a doctor or a nurse, I'll do the same. And if I'm a government minister, I do the same. And that's why, uh, because it's a societal thing, we ban our schools, the schools of our children, communities, because they say they don't like uh, where a border of a municipality is supposed to be. They ban all their schools. What is that? And when we toy toy for this or the other thing, we take our children and put them, put them in front, take them out of school. When we should be keeping our children out of harm's way, we put them in harm's way. The villages and the townships where we stay, we can organize ourselves in such a way that it is not so. So I'm talking about this, about us as a collective, as black people. And they, I'm saying that if we have black consciousness as a come as a, this intangible Wi-Fi that will enable us to do things, all the other things that we are, we are talking about, policing, security, the way we um, uh, manage migration and immigration, the way we teach our children, the way that or not we give our people land or not. And we are not doing that because in my view, we do not in our heart of hearts believe that black people must be given land everywhere in the urban and the rural areas. And if we had, why aren't we giving them land? For 27 years, it is now we are uh, uh, having this endless discussions in parliament about uh, whether or not black people should be given land. Why? So that's just, where I am and, and so what I'm saying it is, uh, I'm, 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 I'm addressing myself to all of us as black people. You know, I was um, I, I was driving down to um, Nelspreet over the weekend, so I had a chance to see South, you know, deep into South Africa, and you see the des like the fact that the worst township in in Johannesburg sometimes does not even touch the the desolation isolation that is felt by some people in the most rural communities in in the country. How do we present what we're talking about. I think it was Lawrence who asked who, who's our target market and who are we talking to? So my question would be, I mean, firstly, um, someone would pull an irony on the fact that the lingo franca of this, of this conversation has been, has been that, but, 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 but equally to the tone and the, um, yeah, the tone and the pitching of the conversation has been, and I understand that we have a very select audience of people, but is there a way of being able to present this um, in a manner that somebody who is in a Sasa queue uh, um, that is in that queue all day long waiting for three, three, 370 rands, that when you speak, they will hear you and, and, and hear the sense of what you're saying. Because I think sometimes the, the thing with black consciousness, I think somebody in the, in the comments was saying, how do we push this idea when even black people are not interested in black consciousness because of what they may from a financial, from a social point of view, stand to lose if in fact you create a more so, um, equal society. Um, so I think maybe Lawrence, you didn't answer who we were talking to. And I think maybe um, not just in terms of the book, but in terms of the broader politics, who are we talking to? Uh, are you talking to me? <clears throat> I, 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 I pulled Lawrence on to answer his own question. I, I think in the main, you know, uh, Dr. Mangena in his book uh, on how we are running the SOEs on, on, the, on education, on the different aspects uh, that he has touched on, uh, uh, the target audience is uh, those that you call polit those in political office. And uh, I think from where I see it, I'm saying we can do our work as activists, but there are those in political office, as he calls them, uh, that still needs to be touched. And 
they believe in their own conferences and their own spaces of engagement. And in fact, I, I don't know how many could even grab the book, uh, you know, we can fix ourselves and, and just to read it, uh, you know, I think that's, that's the most, I think that's where I was going with my, with my question because there's quite good uh, policy uh, proposals in the book. Uh, but are they going to fall on fertile ground or on deaf ears? I think that's the biggest question. Thanks so much, Nzam. Thank you. Auntie Bula, something somebody was saying about um, a black consciousness, if, if even black people are not, are not willing to take this on. I want to come back to a politics of race that has permeated the past 27 years in South Africa, where in fact, even in the examples we're all giving, in our minds, we've got a very specific race of people that we're talking about when we're talking about all of these failures that are happening so that it becomes the black African Batu person who, who is what we're talking about. How, how do we create solidarity, but also expand the idea of what, um, of, of who is affected by the system? Because often when I, as a black woman are talking, I speak at the exclusion of um, the experiences of colored people, of Indian people and so on and so forth, where in fact poverty, according to black consciousness, our experiences of poverty, of, of, um, of uh, suppression should in fact be the thing that creates solidarity. So how do we, in, in fixing ourselves, also fix the relationships between ourselves? All right, so, um, and thank you, Lawrence, for all of uh, your questions around who is this targeted at. The point of this book is that anybody can pick it up. And the point that you're making now in Sato is seriously important. I think people are missing what an opportunity this book provides. All of us to pick up and, and, and solutions, and, and, and solution here is a new uh, word people are using. So what I would do, I, I, I have looked at, I mean, it's health, it's education, it's arts and culture, there's all of that. And the people um, in Nishi and in Kululeko, you're asking, yes, but what's the solution? So we've got to stop looking to, to government. Yes, they exist and they are doing something, right? There are other people who are, uh, who are also social entrepreneurs, NGOs. It's not like there's nothing happening. There's a lot of good things happening in this country. But what's missing maybe is the education that we needed around white privilege, around anti-racist education, which uh, Dr. Mengena invites universities to take a lead in UKZN. Uh, every university should, every university should be running these anti-racism courses, but it can be made into bite-sized pieces on WhatsApp, that kind of thing that young people can take on. So the re-education, of all of the nation, all of us need to get involved in a kind of citizens movement toward uh, standing up in our black power, standing up in our black agency and as, as black citizens. And of course there are white citizens doing a lot of good things too, but they need to be re-educated around why maybe a lot of what they invested in in the last 27 years has not borne the fruit that they might have liked to see. And why we're here in this position right now is because of the things that have been missing, the things that are on the, on the front cover of, of this book, the tinkering in the mind that we need to do. We've got to start doing that work now, all of us. It doesn't matter whether we're paid or not paid. It doesn't matter whether it's part-time, whether it's volunteer. We're going to lose this country. We are, we're in dire, dire straits. Uh, we're practically bankrupt. Every bit of of, of, of those points are made. And I agree with the people. It's, it's no longer time to, to keep talking about what those problems are. They're very well, well handled in the book. And there are a number of solutions. Whatever you think as a person, get up. I would suggest a compact under every one of Dr. Mangena's headings. So if there are people who are, I feel ashamed actually that I cannot make a contribution around trains and taxis, for example, that I know nothing about transport, that I cannot make a proper uh, contribution in health, uh, migration even. But they are, there's so much that ordinary people who want to get this country right can get up and do. And there will be people then, form a compact in your area. Yes, there can't be too many people because that's just going to be another talk shop. We're tired of talk shops. The people who want to do something, 
organize in every one of these areas that Dr. Mangena has outlined. Get up tomorrow, call your people together and start to, to do something about it. That's what I think. And I think it's possible. And that's what Black Consciousness and Black Agency is about. Thank you. Thank you. If I may, just for like a minute each, um, we had mentioned that um, some of the youth in your programs are part of the are part of the conversation. Um, please feel free to raise your hand so that I can see where you are, and I will be able to um, have you join the conversation. I'm not sure if on the platform you are you are uh, participating from, you're able to do so. But if you are, I'd really um, like to have your input in the conversation. Um, as um, then, then the, the, the thing about the economy, if we're not ready to, to make serious changes to our economy, and I don't mean making lip service about, you know, white monopoly capital, blah, 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 but I mean re real significant um, changes that probably will have to lean us more towards a more socialist way. Are we having a, a talk? A talk shop about black consciousness. Are we are, are we in, inherently in a system that breeds inequality? And so to speak about we are broken, let's fix ourselves, but without truly wanting to engage with what it means to fix ourselves, is this just a talk? A, a, is this a, j, j, just a talk shop? And I will go with Usi um, I, I can see you there. If you're able to participate, please, please do. Sibabalo, are you able to, there we go. Welcome. Hello, hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you to the panelists, thank you to the respondents and thank you to Dr. Mangena. And thank you to Umtapo also for such a um, honorable um, opportunity to have us speak as the youth of Umtapo. Um, so uh, my question is obviously gonna be trying to link the youth into the conversation, because what we see now is a distrust, a lack of trust between um, the elders, people who were born before 1994, 1994 and people who were born after. So people who are being called freedom kids and people who have now gained this freedom that came with 1994. But what we're seeing is that there's a lack of trust on each of the age groups, there's a lack of, there's a gap where we see that the youth does not believe that their elders or the leaders have the capacity to lead um, in, a, in a world that is now free from oppression that was once um, politically owned by white people. And we also see on the other side, um, elders and uh, leaders um, who do not trust young, the youth to actually have the common um, sense or the knowledge or the experience to lead um, the new South Africa, the new dawn after 1994. So how are we gonna be using black consciousness to bridge that gap to allow for both, um, for both South African, um, for both um, groups, for both the youth and people that have the wisdom who've been through what um, 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 who've been through the struggle of what it means to be a black person. But now we have us who actually have trying to disseminate and trying to deal colonize what it means to be a youth. So we are the ones that are also on the front line trying to fight off this, this, um, this system that has been placed on us, this stain that has been placed on what it means to be a black person. But it, is, it seems like the fight is also more within you know, um, us being trying to train into the way of thinking that must follow elders or leaders that are still stuck in that way of thinking. So how do we um, bridge the gap between um, the youth and elders? How do these sort of webinars and um, the workshops that we have and um, any form of talk shows or talks that we have, how do we allow the youth to also step in and hear their voices and what they think or what they feel is, is, is a problem in today's society in what it means to live in today's society where you are conflicted. You don't know whether you are a black person that is still oppressed or you actually have a kind of freedom that um, is being told that you, you probably are too spoiled because you've got too much freedom. 
So you don't know mm-hmm. if you actually do have this freedom or you don't have this freedom. So how are we using black consciousness as this means to actually close that age gap? Because that is then the answer to how we move forward and how we actually then um, perpetuate a better generation moving forward. Um, okay. I, thank you. Okay, thank you, Han. I think Petunia has something. Her hand was up first. If I can just restrict everybody to just a minute, if if we're going to get everybody in, um, Petunia, you do you do you have a contribution to that? Hi, good evening to everyone, and thank you very much for this time. I had only two points made out. Is it fine with my video? You're fine. Okay. Um, I just, I had only two points which I wanted to make and one was just a question. But first of all, I wanted to say uh, what I think with regards to everything is that we are, we as black people are our own enemies. We are enemies, we fight against each other. We fight within ourselves. But one was a question where I wanted to know, are we there yet? And the answer might say, we are not. But have we started trying to process everything, trying to see through ourselves, trying to get solutions on how we are going to fight uh, the, the, the song we are having each and every day to say, okay, we want to see ourselves as black people getting to a certain point. What are we doing? Are the policies which are, are being formed day in and day out being implemented now that is the question what are we doing as black people are we standing up for ourselves or we are sitting down and waiting for someone to lead and then cry about it later thank you thank you thank you petunia um sean do you have a contribution to that sean i can see your hand is up i was wondering if you have a contribution to add to the conversation there we go uh, yes, I actually do. Um, thank you very much, um, Dako, and thank you to our guest speaker um, for such a wonderful presentation, and also to our discussants for the excellent remarks and probing questions that they um, actually um, contributed to the conversation. Um, like Vutu, I had quite a number of points that I actually wanted to make, but I'll just restrict myself to one point and then just quickly one question. Now, one of the uh, issues that I actually wanted to table in the discussion is, has already been touched on. And that's the issue of decolonization. Because um, one of the things that um, colonialists understood is that brute violence alone was not enough to sustain colonialism. So there needed to be another assault on a different front. And that's how we actually ended up with um, epistemic violence. And that's one of the reasons why there's this whole call for the decolonization of um, education. And one of the things that um, Prof. Ma- Dr. Mangena actually mentioned um, is that we need to uh, be teaching our kids in their mother tongue, in their home languages. And then uh, Prof. Julian also added that we need to be introducing our kids um, to books in their um, own um, languages so that they can better understand and have a grasp of these um, kinds of concepts. So for me, um, it it becomes very problematic because when we as the youth, for example, advocated for decolonized education through Fees Must Fall, one of the major obstacles that we faced was from the very institutions themselves that are now calling for decolonized education. So how can we as the youth trust these institutions, when we call for decolonized education, they confronted us with violence. And that is sort of like the same colonial logic that is employed by the state. Uh, Whenever black people voice their grievances, Um, Marikana, for example, the state used violence as a means of communication, just like the apartheid government did. Um, So that was just quickly my contribution to the conversation. And the question that I have um, for Dr. Mangena, if there's time, is um, I'd like to know what is Black consciousness view on intersection, intersectionality and how do we factor in that intersectional conversation into this discussion that we're having? Because one of, the, one of the things that we have to understand is that racism, for example, is not a standalone thing. Racism intersects with classism. Racism intersects with gender. And you have 
all these kinds of different intersections. So then how do we put that into the discussion and what is Black consciousness view on intersectionality? Thank you very much, Dako. Thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate your, your contributions. And I think you've, um, some of your questions might just require us to meet again, which is a good thing. Um, I think now I'm going to start tapering everything down a little bit. And I wanted to, um, to just go back to our panelists. And if I could start with, um, with the Professor Julian and just give everybody a minute. I, I, this time I, I will kind of knock on everyone to, um, so that we, we are done by seven o'clock. Uh, we've got just about 10 minutes to, um, to just wrap everything down. But if I could give Prof Professor Julian, having heard everybody's contributions and um, uh, perhaps you might have your, your uh, closing remarks or uh, feedback to what you've, um, what you've heard. Yeah, I'll go with Dana and I'll go on so, um, <clears throat> Ms. Machabella. Um, mm. As I responded in one of the chat um, messages or questions, we are the solution. I'm the solution. And the time for looking externally, you know, to some type of salvific figure to come to our rescue is, 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 is over, far, I mean, it's, it's far gone. And colonialism has instituted a dependence. You know, it's almost like a beggar mentality. And, and, and that's why I critique capitalism because capitalism is based on debt. You know, we owe money and they own us and they control us. So we need to begin to break out of debt. You know, we need to live simple lives. I struggle with, uh, with that all the time being here. You know, I use whatever resources I can to help people, the pandemic, Africa, Latin America, the Pacific, you know, and so on. And, uh, you know, we can never stop and pat ourselves on the back and say, well, you know, I gave this, I did what I could. This is eternal. Kwame Tura used to say, I'm taking the struggle to the grave. I used to speak around Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael. You know, this is an eternal struggle. It's a struggle for life. It's a struggle for the earth. And don't forget the earth and all the living creatures on this earth, wherever we are. This is a struggle in honor of the ancestors of Yah Sentawa, of Steve Biko, Chris Han, Lilian Ngoi, Victoria and Griffith Lange you know, um, Ashley Creel. I mean, you know, you can go down the list, you know, all the people that I mentioned in the book and, and Nahanda and, and just go across the continent, Patrice Lumumba, you know, um, Kwame Nkrumah, Malcolm X, you know, we Sojourner Truth. I mean, we, we, we need to always recognize our real heroes, part of our ancestors, a part of us. I am here because people died so I could be a so-called professor. You are in the university because somebody else could not make it, okay? You are occupying a very privileged position. Speaking in English on Zoom is a privilege. We need to recognize these and be humble about that. See, even while we are critical. And so we have to balance. You have to be rooted, as uh, Comrade Mangano says in his book, rooted in your language, in your culture, in your ancestors, proud of that, bathe in that, but also engage, broaden your perspective. Don't be limited. You know, the, the cry in the townships, I don't have anything. 350 Rand is what the government is providing for me per month. And I can't, I struggle to get that. What a disgrace in South Africa. What a disgrace why people make millions. You see, shamelessness. But we don't need to be a part of that culture. We need to separate. You know, we need to separate. And, and that's what socialism and in, indigenous African socialism, socialism of the means of production and of land. There you have it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Abula, if you would uh, be able to come back with your uh, reflections, please.
oh, I see the light hasn't improved. <laughs> <sighs> I think that Professor Cooney has done an amazing job of, of getting us to think more reflectively of calming down. I mean, I need to be calmed down because I'm an activist and I um, like to do things and I like to get things done. And I see so much potential in this book, so much advice for us to act that I just want to, it's almost like Dr. Mangan is the Pied Piper of, and, and, and of this time, of this particular year, this 27th year since our democracy. And South Africans are feeling hopeless. They're feeling angry. They're feeling bereft. They're feeling frustrated. Every single day, the news is, is bad. I mean, the three girls shot in Kailicha, the, 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 the four-year-old uh, killed on the Cape Flat, well, in Ottery this morning. It is too much what we're going through, but, but nevertheless, there are those of us, there is always hope. There is always hope. And I'm a firm believer in that. And I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to do something to get us back on the right track because I believe we can fix ourselves. You're mute. Ah, thank you. Um, Lawrence, uh, May, may I please have your closing remarks on the conversation and the discussion? And um, yeah. Thanks. I think, I think at, at a more practical uh, level, I think we can definitely use the book or Black Consciousness rather as a Wi Fi in our, in our diverse social, economic, and political uh, persuasions. And I think. Uh, I think one of the commitments I make today is that we, we have a school that we are working with uh, in Limpopo, uh, in the Collins Chabani local municipality, where we are piloting a model for renewable energy technologies and, and food gardens and so on. And I think we will take this book and form part of the conversations that we'll, ha we'll be having with the, with the agricultural you know, uh, uh, farmers clubs uh, that we are uh, you know, establishing in that part of the, of the country. So I think at a more practical level, because these conversations must happen in our own families, in our own communities. So to be able to really take, uh, uh, become you know, the wave in the, in the Wi-Fi that uh, Dr. Mangena uh, uh, refers to. And I think if we're able, we could each buy a book and at least donate to one of the schools, you know, so that we would really start the, the conversation, spark the debates and, you know, the discourse around, around the book because it's quite relevant, it's contemporary and so on. Thank you very much, uh, Nzako, for the opportunity. And thanks to the leadership of the, of the UKZN as well as Umtapo Center. Thanks. Thanks, Lawrence. That was great. Um, Dr. Mangana, I think when you do make your, 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 your remarks, if you can maybe lead people to where they can get the book, because I think you've uh, whet a few appetites um, for it. Um, and if I may, if I may um, give you the floor once again. Yes, thank you. Mzako. The book is available at exclusive books, bargain books, and I don't know which other book, I, I mean, bookshop I couldn't. I could uh, name, but <clears throat> it should be available in all uh, good shops, uh, bookshops around, around the country. But so many points have been raised, the good points, wonderful points. Um, there are two minutes left, but all I can say is that there is no time to uh, uh, refer to the, all those good points that were made. And as Nsako had said, perhaps uh, some of those points that were raised require further discussion by all of us. You know, in our youth, when we were in, in SASO and uh, the uh, BPC and other Black Consciousness uh, organizations, we hit the streets. We didn't just uh, uh, theorize. We were in the streets talking to ourselves, talking to our people. And Zago referred to um, Zanim Pilo Clinic in the in the uh, Eastern Cape. We went out and established a, a clinic. Uh, we were in Winterfeld uh, teaching our people in the churches how to read and write. 
and how to give them agency. And in the process of doing that, saying to our people, you have got agency, you can change your circumstances. You are not useless, you are not hopeless. You can change your circumstances. And we had uh, other people in the Eastern Cape having their own uh, projects to help themselves out of uh, misery, being able to establish um, vegetable gardens and other such cottage industries that helped them. And it, there is no reason why now we cannot once more go to our people, hit the streets and talk amongst ourselves so that we might get ourselves out of the rut in which we find ourselves presently. But thank you to everyone who have participated and come with so many beautiful ideas. Thank you so much, Ndate. Um, I think for me, I'm, um, I would just like to steal two minutes of your time. Um, Auntie Arun, I, I, um, I wanted to just give you a minute if you wanted to talk about some of the work that you guys are doing at Umtapo and just uh, part of this, um, and also for being part of this conversation. Um, your hand was not up, but I volunteered you just for a second. Uh, thank you, um, Zako. Um, you know, I hear, I've watched the chats and I've seen the Q&A. We can talk in flowery language. We can talk um, in very revolutionary language, but from the work that needs to be done right here and now is to take this book to wherever we can go to and have dialogues with people, you know, um, we used to call them listening posts. Wherever you find yourself with people, you talk this. You don't need to have a webinar. You don't need to, you don't need lots of money. So speaking truth to power is about going from theory to practice, action, reflection, critical reflection. And that's what Comrade Mangena is telling us. It's a clarion call people. We can fix ourselves. When I know who I am, when I keep asking, who am I? Not in a chronology, but what values underpin who I am? And so if you, if you ask me what Umtapo does, that's what Umtapo does. How do you free your mind and to free your land? What values would underpin that? So, Let's not make it a mammoth task, but to come together as collectives with no flowery language, but in how Comrade Mangena has written this book. Let's go out there and go and do it. Do we have the guts and the courage to go there and call this beautiful, beautiful land, Azania, as a group of people who can participate together? So that's what I want to say. Thank you so much, Auntie Arun. So I'm gonna take the position of being old enough to be old and young enough to be young. Um, and, and to the young um, who, who are amongst us, who are so in inspiring that you guys are part of this conversation to simply say to you, those you see as old people in this particular conversation never asked for permission when they were young people. They never got surprised when they were met with bullets. Okay, of course you were surprised, but that's what happens when you want to make change. You get met with sometimes resistance and you must be willing to take resistance. And so I want to say one, take heart, but two, rather than seeing these as old people, see them as uh, people who once were young and really, really brave. And I would say, please take on the same courage because if we're going to change anything, you're never going to ask for permission and you're always going to have to just take it um, or, or work towards doing it. Um, thank you so much, for everyone. I've, I've, been, I've been following the chats on the side. The conversation has, has, has been lively. And it, it tells me that there is much yet to be discussed amongst and um, amongst us and with each other. And so I would encourage the conversation to continue um, and also just to continue in, in, 
in the name of and in honor of Steve Biko and understanding that when we talk about black consciousness, this is a 1970s idea, but it is it is now morphed into what we need it to be. So the pressures we want to put on it to say, does it, how does it address women? How does it uh, um, address gender issues? How does it affect se sexual orientation? It will affect it as we make it affect it in accepting that B B Bika was a young man who created a movement. And so we are tasked, as Auntie Arun says, this is a clarion call to say, stop asking for permission. Stop saying the old people don't let you sit at the table, sit at the table, own the table, and understand there is so much work yet to be done. For UMTAPO, um, for UKZN, um, the, the um, Gracious uh, members of the panel, thank you so much for your time and for um, and for sharing so um, so generously with us. Um, I will now take um, give the reins back to the program director and say thank you so much for this evening. And um, I hope this is not the end of the conversation, but rather the triggering of new thoughts in taking this forward. Thank you so much. Have we lost? Uh, Linda, we, have... we have Linda to do the vote of thanks. Uh, there we go. There we go. Thank Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you, Linda. Yeah. You've muted yourself again, Linda. Oh, my word. Right, good, now that's good, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes, go okay. ahead. Okay. Um, my job is the um, easiest one, I think, where I have to thank everyone that made sure this uh, webinar is happening. I will start with the Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Nana Potu of the UKZN for partnering with UMTAPO for this uh, webinar. And then, um, the next one is Ms. Norma Zondo, the Executive Director of Corporate Relations for always supporting UMTAPO's work. I would also like to um, thank Ms. Hazel Langa for the welcome address and Pamela Adams, who has worked with UMTAPO over the years in planning and coordinating the lectures and the webinars. Would also like extend um, uh, gratitude to Shakila, Kurt, and Musa, and the ICS division of UKZN, and also um, a special thanks to the keynote speaker, Dr. Mangena, and the respondents, especially for the speakers that reminded us about the state of our nation with a view of black consciousness, challenging us to rethink as to how we conscientize the next generation into a better thinking nation with good values and self-reliance. And uh, lastly, I would also like to thank the moderator, Ms. Nzakum Kapela, who has done a beautiful job making sure that we are challenged and the speakers can speak clearly to our conscience so that we can be able to have um, 
a provision to think about and be challenged to start working towards fixing ourselves. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you, Linda. Um, Auntie Arun, is the, is, the, is the program director gonna take it back or are we done for the evening? And Zako, we are done for the evening. I think mm -hmm. we're playing out with the song that we started off with. Thanks everybody, bye-bye, take care. Thanks, Nzako. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Good, Good night. night. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, Arun. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Doesn't seem you. like anybody wants to go. <laughs> so maybe yeah. we should start planning what's going to happen next. No, I think I can I, if you're not done, can I close? I'm sure Musa, I'm not sure if Musa's up. Wouldn't be able to upload the music now. Hi, can I just say thank you everybody for a wonderful, informative and very interesting webinar. And thank you so much. Um, thank you, Dina, there's Linda, Arun, Professor Cooney, that's on still. And uh, we will chat again, but take care. I'm going to end the webinar now. <laughs>